Here, read this. Woof. All right, so today I'm going to be talking about two recent novels about Sylvia Plath. Uh, about a year ago or so, maybe longer, I made a video about three other novels about Plath, um, and that gave us a fairly even spread. One of them uh, I love, Wintering. Uh, one of them I was pretty keen on, and then the other one, I, the third one, I, I hated. I'm afraid the tone of this video is going to be slightly more negative, as um, I didn't like either of them. I tried to keep the channel mostly recommends. Uh, you know, the podcast is always recommending whatever book I, I, I'm talking about. Uh, but there's no two ways about it. Um, I did think both of these novels um, were crap. And since Sylvia Plath has become such a, a recurring topic on, on the podcast, I, I, I feel I do want to talk about them. Now, one of them I have actually reviewed in the Glasgow Review of Books, and I'll link that review uh, below. That's Euphoria, which I'll, I'll talk about second. Uh, it's the one I, I, I hated the most. Um, but we'll, we'll start with the other one, which is The Last Confessions of Sylvia P by Lee Kravitz. This came out in 2022, so last year. And I have to say, just from the title, uh, this rather had my heck hackles raised. Um, I was thinking to myself, what exactly does Sylvia Plath have left to confess? And I was also um, somewhat put off by the... the the implication perhaps that we were going to be talking about Sylvia Plath as solely a confessional poet, as indeed um, the book does. Uh, so the, the story is sort of split into three. We have a, a plot line in 2019 featuring a museum creator called Esti, who has discovered what appears to be a manuscript draft of the Bell Jar. We have two other uh, strands in sort of different timelines. One of them is a poet called Boston Rhodes, who encounters Plath in Robert Lowell's workshop in the 50s. And then we have a storyline with uh, Ruth Barnhouse, uh, Plath's psychiatrist, recounting how she met Plath and uh, and kind of reflecting on on um, her psychiatric treatment. Now, there's lots of aspects to the, to the premise and the setup of this novel that I think are, are really intriguing. Um, it involves a kind of rebirth of Plath in this in this discovery of another manuscript of the Bell Jar. Uh, rebirth is, of course, such a strong theme in Plath's work and in and in Plath's studies. So um, that that's that's tantalising to begin with. Um, there is also the sort of archive hunting side of the plot, which is fun. It kind of at various points I, w I was thinking this this is almost a novel in which. Uh, several of my podcast guests could appear as side characters. Um, so I, I enjoyed that. And there is, of course, plenty of mileage in the subject of missing Plath material. It's, it's in fact, almost strange that uh, Kravitz chose to go with, uh, you know, a draft of the Bell Jar instead of one of the missing novels or perhaps a, a missing journal. Um, and then there is the kind of rival poet motif uh, exemplified in the relationship between Boston Rhodes and Plath. Plath obviously has the poem, The Rival, uh, which features in the book. Plath had a keen sense of competition, so so that kind of sit, seems in, in keeping too. Down to the, fo the format is also intriguing. It's uh, divided into nine parts, nine stanzas, um, bringing to mind nine stanza poems by Plath, like Tulips, or uh, a poem like uh, Metaphors, which begins, I'm a riddle in nine syllables. It has the appearance of a literary mystery. There's a kind of cryptogrammatic feel to it. There's, there's reference to uh, Plath dropping letters off certain pieces of writing that spell out lines of poetry. Um, in Kravitz's novel, our main character or, or uh, primary narrator is called S.T., S.T. She meets characters called things like J.J. and Elton. So you have a you have an impression of a world made up of of letters of a, of a puzzle to be put together. All this um, is very promising in my book. However, something about it just just doesn't work. Um, Boston Rhodes, the the central uh, as in the middle of the three narrators. Um, turns out to be a pseudonym of a poet called Agatha White. But anyone who knows uh, Plath, anyone who knows uh, the story behind Robert Lowell's workshop, anyone that has read uh, Gail Crowther's book, uh, Three Martini Afternoons at the Ritz, which I have to say, um, this novel suffers quite a lot for being published in close proximity to that book. That book tells the story of Plath at Robert Lowell's workshops and her relationship with Anne Sexton, who... Um, uh, Kravitz disguises Anne Sexton, basically uses Anne Sexton as a model for his character, Boston Rhodes. Knowing the real story, um, 
is a bit of a problem. Uh, I, I'm all for, you know, fictionalizing, changing things that happened and everything. Um, but I don't think Kravitz gets the balance between what he invents and completely goes off the deep end with and the things that he keeps. It, it, it creates this weird kind of dissonance where um, certain scenes are very realistic and very true to life and are represented um, seemingly accurately. And then other things are so wild and out there, it it, it verges on feeling libelous at times. He, he could have maybe done with taking a leaf out of the bell jar and fictionalizing a bit more, uh, maybe not even naming Plath, maybe having a, uh, a, you know, a novel inspired by events in Plath's life, um, but changing all the names and, and kind of covering his tracks a bit more. The reason being that this character, Boston Rhodes, who is very clearly modelled on Anne Sexton, she she writes Anne Sexton poems. I mean, it, it's uh, it's not up for debate um, whether or not it is Anne Sexton or just an invented poet. Um, she becomes this sort of Salieri figure, increasingly jealous of the young Plath. Uh, this is where Kravitz needs to fictionalise the most in order to make Sexton jealous of Plath in a way that in reality, resembles the way Plath was jealous of Sexton. Um, he has to make Plath uh, already famous when she turns up to Robert Lowell's workshop, which she wasn't. Her and Ted Hughes, so successful that in one um, particularly ridiculous moment, they are said to be uh, quaffing screwdrivers with Truman Capote, hanging out with Marlon Brando um, and, uh, and Audrey Hepburn, which they most certainly didn't. Although I would, I would love to have just re- just read a scene um, featuring Ted Hughes and Truman Capote sharing cocktails. That would be fantastic. And then when Plath dies, there are, um, Kravitz tells us, hundreds of people at her funeral in the church in Heptonstall, which is uh, also didn't happen. So it does feel odd. Um, I'm not as familiar with Sexton as Plath, but from what I've heard and the little that I've read, I get the impression that Sexton was intimidated by Plath kind of posthumously. You know, once Ariel had come out and she saw how good of a of a poet Plath was, it was Plath who, you know, was writing in her journals, gosh, I, I, my, my poems are, are so stiff. I, I could do with some of that uh, directness and that ferocity that, that a poet like Sexton has when she was in those um, workshops chaired by Robert Lowell. Now handled differently, this sort of like swapping of who was jealous of who and, and who was the senior poet, um, This it could have had an almost kind of Mulholland Drive sort of effect where persona and, and person get blurred, roles get swapped around, rivalries get inverted. But unfortunately, the book's just not quite good enough to, to go there. And by sticking to biographical fact in so many places, gets really quite dodgy. Um, so it is Anne Sexton who um, drives Plath to suicide in this version of the story. It's Anne Sexton who takes photos of Hughes having an affair and then sends them to Plath. That's what tips her over the edge. Anne Sexton claims that the bell jar was inspired by her work. And Anne Sexton um, then steals Plath's posthumous remaining work to use it as fuel for her own after she died. Esty, the um, the sort of present day narrator, 2019 narrator, uh, it turns out to be Boston Rhodes's daughter um, living in Boston. Uh, and uh, Boston Rhodes thought that Plath had taken the name of her character, Esther Greenwood, from her daughter, Esty. Again, there's this sort of gesturing at a kind of Russian doll effect of lots and lots of mirrors, Esty the narrator, Esther Greenwood, um, pseudonyms abound, but it all turns to schlock towards the end. There is there is a sort of Ocean, Ocean's Eleven ripoff in, t- in terms of um, how, what climax involving the manuscript being swapped and CCTVs being tampered with, all a bit odd. But the main problem I have with it is that it's this world of high fl- high-flying poets um, who just say the, the stupidest things in writing. You know, when one of them says, poetry moves us, but nobody ever says how it moves us. You just can't help thinking, is that true? Is that true within this circle of literary types that you have in the novel? Would one of these poets um, derive as banal a moral as we only really hear when we listen? Would an Anne Sexton figure say that carbon monoxide filled every inch of the garage 
editing the oxygen the same way I cross out words on a page. Lines and moments like that make the whole poetic world of this novel feel really unconvincing, especially when the uh, biographical side of the story is, is really emphasised. You know, this is the real Sylvia Plath, this is the real Ted Hughes, this is the real Marianne Moore, this is the real Robert Lowell. Again, maybe if it was a little bit more fictionalised, uh, Kravitz would have given himself a bit more rope. I ended up being just quite kind of annoyed by the novel, to be honest. Not as annoyed as I was by Euphoria, which uh, was written by the Swedish author Ellen Kullhead. This came out, I think, end of last year. So they're actually both 2022 novels. Um, this uh, tells the story of Platt's final year in Devon, uh, breakdown of her marriage, Hughes' affair with Asia Wevel, Platt's increasing desperation. I hesitate to even say Platt because the, the character that calls itself Sylvia Plath in this novel is so far from Sylvia Plath that it just feels offensive to um, to describe her that way. It's told in the first person. In my review, I compared the characterization of Sylvia Plath to demonic possession because if you've ever read a Plath poem, an entry, one entry in her journals, you would um, shrink from what you see on the very first page. Uh, the writing of this character calling itself Sylvia Plath is so mindless, um, so deeply trivial, and so current era, it's, ju it's just the effect is horrible. The quickest way I can describe the prose style is by saying, if at one point Sylvia Plath said lol, you wouldn't blink. I felt sort of beaten down by this free association style that, that Cullhead uses, where really dumb connections between bits of imagery will be forced together in a careless and sloppy way that someone like Plath would just never dream of. There's an example of this on the very first page. I can never cease to live... Uh, this is Plath talking about her children. I can never cease to live for them, no matter how much of Ted's skin they also possess. Ted's snake skin. He who opens his maw and presses the prey hole into his mouth until you choke. Beyond the surface stupidity of that image, uh, Ted Hughes detaching his jaw and swallowing something, Ted Hughes swallowing something and you choking, no less... The free association of it is really eye-catching and really crap. My children have skin. Ted has snake skin. Ted swallows prey whole. It sounds like the kind of connection you'd improvise in um, a spoken word battle. It's, uh, it's dreadful. Other aspects of the style I really don't like are uh, Sylvia Plath coming out with keep calm and carry on like truisms all the way through. We were we. Uh, food, food is good, it's good to eat that's a good one and then there's also this this uh, just hammering repetition of synonyms and phrases I was the nerves, I was the blood I was the heart, I was the white skin I was the string of pearls I was the marble, I was the dove, I was the deer I was the dead mole we found on the ground I was the girl, I was the woman I was the mother of his children uh, I'll stop but I mean a good third of the novel is that and what's so annoying about the style is it's that banal, that surface level, and that uh, trite, but has the cadences of overreaching itself to, to sound poetic, which leads to constant confusion uh, between literal and figurative imagery. At one point she says, um, I had to constantly put this circus of the self on display. I couldn't stop the movement in my own blood. To which you think, well, you shouldn't stop the movement in your own blood. You'd just die. My favourite one of these, though, is when uh, uh, Sylvia Plath says at one point, I got full on carrot cake. And genuinely, when I read it the first time, I was thinking, like, has Plath suddenly, like, gone carrot cake? Can you suddenly, like, go totally carrot cake? Turns out she just meant that she'd just had enough carrot cake. The novel's called Euphoria. Apparently this refers to, um, you know, the, the euphoria of writing that comes with the pain of life. I got absolutely zero impression that, that writing was uh, enjoyable. It was just another thing to feel like a martyr about as well as life. Um, the book as a whole is far too romantically in love with the idea of a mad poet genius in a way that really is uh, truly revolting. Um, it's bumper sticker plath. She's just a mad girl, you know. She's gone totally banana bread. Um, and the more I think about it, I think that the, the what I really object to in both of these novels is sort of the same thing. It's an undervaluing of Plath's ideas, an overemphasis on this confessional side of Plath. Ellen Cullhead says in Euphoria, um, she says it outright, Plath doesn't gather material, she is the material, me, me, me. 
that I don't think that's true. It's why I kind of recoil a bit when, when Plath is described as a confessional poet. She does meet some of the parameters of confessional poetry, but I think confessionalism fails to describe the effect of reading Plath. It fails to describe, in my opinion, a lot of what's great about Plath. It has the effect of de-emphasizing the art side of Sylvia Plath and seeing her instead as a sort of checkpoint in a story of social change. In other words, judging this um, supremely gifted artist by a non-artistic criterion. Uh, the problem with that being, as Bridget Brophy once said, in art, nothing goes beyond art. For one reason or another, I keep getting reminded at the moment is of something Brophy said about um, uh, Jane Austen and Mozart, which I just I love because it's it's just delightfully straight to the point and unequivocal. Jane Austen differs from her 18th century predecessors only as Mozart differs from most of his. She was a better artist. And that's kind of how I think about Plath and the uh, and the other confessionals. Uh, I'm really interested in them. I, I like Anne Sexton. I like Robert Lowell. But when I think about Plath, I, th I think almost petulantly and oversimplistically. Well, she, I mean, she, she's a bit like that in some ways, but she, she's just better. I know that's not a very intelligent thing to say. But what I find lacking from both of these novels is any uh, engagement with the, the art side of Plath. And since they're both fixated on writing, uh, that's a real problem. I don't think you need to be touched by genius to write a novel about Sylvia Plath. I don't think you need to, uh, you know, match her concentration of imagery with your own. I don't think you'd need to be attuned to all of her inspirations and, uh, and any of that. But if you're going to address her writing, um, you, you do need to raise your game a bit. You do need to not come out, uh, not put banalities and uh, piggery sounds in the mouth of the colossus that is Plath. Yeah, and that's why I think still uh, the only true successful novel that has that has done that is Kate Moses' Wintering, which does engage with the art side of Plath, does use um, Plath's imagery and writing as grist for its mill as much as her life. Anyway, two negative um, reviews of Plath novels. Sorry for if any of that got a little bit ranty. I will try and balance it out with something uh, positive next time. Um, thank you very much for watching, and until next time, happy reading.